Hello, everybody, and welcome to Psalms Bible Study on this Wednesday, September the 30th of 2020. We are in the first and the last day of September, but uh, this last day of September is going to let us see Psalms 138 through 140. So good to have you with us today. And this, uh, this section, um, 138, it's the first one in a series of eight psalms. Uh, that are written by David now. Um, the very concluding Psalms 146 to 50 are Psalms of praise, uh, kind of like a benediction uh, closing. So in, in a way, this, these are the closing section of Psalms, and it, it's very fitting that David would be the author of these, these eight Psalms near the end, as, they, as he was the author of so many of, of the Psalms. If we have uh, 138 to 145, uh, 138 is going to be a psalm of praise, uh, 145 also a psalm of praise, and uh, the middle six are uh, 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 to prayer. Actually, the, sorry, the, um, yeah, the, the middle six are prayer psalms. So, may the kings praise you. A uh, psalm of praise with 138. It is by King David. And Niles, I've got you at the top of the list today, if you don't mind uh, taking us here from the start with uh, all of Psalm 138, uh, 1 through 8. <coughs> Excuse me. Niles, you, you got me there, and maybe we lost your audio. Carol, uh, why don't you go ahead and read then? I think we might have lost Niles, uh, taking verses 1 through 8. Okay. Thanks from a grateful heart. I will thank you with all my heart. Before the gods, I will make music for you. I will bow down toward your holy temple. I will give thanks to your name because of your mercy and because of your truth. Yes, you made your word even greater than your name. <clears throat> by day I called and you answered me you have made my soul strong all the kings of the earth will thank you Lord when they have heard the message from your mouth then they will sing about the ways of the Lord because the glory of the Lord is great indeed the Lord is exalted but he sees the lowly and he recognizes the proud from a distance if I walk surrounded by danger, you keep me alive in spite of the anger of my enemies. You stretch out your hand. You save me with your right hand. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Lord, your mercy endures forever. Do not let go of the works of your hands. So, yeah, thank you for uh, reading that. And, and a few uh, questions immediately came out to my mind as I read it through and We'll address those, and if anything you have in addition to them. Most of the questions are associated with the uh, footnotes uh, in the EHV, so we will comment on those. I think we lost John Scott in our study, so I'm not sure if I need to welcome him back in. Um, yeah, he should be here. All right, so as we are there, uh, first off, we have that thanks from a grateful heart. And David says, before the gods, here in verse 1, I will make music for you. Making music to the Lord um, uh, before the gods. And gods, uh, obviously with a small g here, since it's plural, uh, it oftentimes can refer to the heathen idols. Rarely, on occasion, it refers to the angels. Um, and on occasion, it also refers to the earthly rulers or governments because they're God's representatives. If you caught the context of this psalm as we read through, especially when you get to verse 4, with the kings uh, as the, the main recipients here and their encouragement to praise the Lord, um, we do have uh, the probably the third is the best fit in the context that when it says before the gods, I will make music to you, it's referring to the earthly kings, earthly authorities as God's representatives. Uh, that's even different, though, than the, the, this EHV commentary suggests that it is, um, it is before the, that this reference to the other gods is just uh, the truth that um, 
God is higher than any other God because there is no such thing as a pagan God. Any questions or comments on, on that explanation from verse 1? Okay. So then we have praise to the Lord. And as I, we talked about a number of times, as we praise the Lord with the hallels or the hallelujah, it's not just saying praise the Lord with those words, but we have a catalog of the, of the things the Lord does. And that list is why we praise him, praising him for his, his goodness, actually the way he blessed David personally. Um, that's why he bows down for the, the mercy of the Lord, the truth of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the name of the Lord, and how he answers prayer, and then strength that he gives. Uh, a number of times we've spoken about this word mercy. Um, that is the chesed in the Hebrew. It, it's a word for faithful love. It's equated with, uh, with grace in addition to uh, uh, keeping his promised covenant. And David would definitely be thankful for that. And, and that mercy, that grace, then also accompanies the truth. You know, so we have the balance of the mercy. Truth not only includes God's mercy, it also includes his commandments and his law. So we also uh, give thanks to the Lord for that. Um, his word is even greater than his name. And that Hebrew, I'm going to read the, the EHV footnote. It's literally, it says, for you have made great over all your name, your saying. So the, the commentators, because of your mercy, I'm sorry, you made your word even greater than your name. The point is, God is great his words, and his name. God is great above all in that. And so really underlines that, that, uh, that greatness of, of him, his name, his word, both of those are how he reveals himself and then the ability to pray um, it, and have him answer and strength. So uh, any questions here about, um, uh, about this catalog of the ways God has blessed his people? All right. Um, sounds good. As we, we move on, the key to this whole psalm would be verses 4 and 5, talking about kings joining in the praise of the Lord. And then verse 6 is it kind of lets us know this is a connecting Psalm 138. It, this one takes us to the next Psalm 139, uh, looking about the Lord's greatness, how he looks down and he knows. Uh, that really, uh, we see that refrain brought up in verse 6 again. And then verse 8, you know, Lord, your mercy endures forever. Does that sound familiar? From last Sunday, right? The Psalm 136 um, had the entire psalm. Each verse had a refrain that said, for your mercy endures forever. Um, and then maybe that, that first part of verse 8, uh, in every situation, it's a good to remember that. Whatever life may bring, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for us. Uh, and then that personal pronoun, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. I'm going to pause here. I've been talking quite a bit, or talking our way through this. Um, but if anybody has any questions or any comments, or wants to go ahead and just uh, try out your microphone, because I think we've had a few people with some issues. Sue, go ahead. Sue, can you? Um, yeah, we're having a little trouble. I think, yeah, I don't know if you can hear me. I, am I coming through at all? Yes, you are, Sue. Niles left. Okay, I, Niles did leave. I have a question or a, a clarification need, maybe. Please. Um, where in uh, verse, in verse seven, um, where it says, you stretched out your hand, you saved me with your right hand. Does right hand have any special connotation yeah the the right hand um obviously god doesn't have the physical hands except in the person of christ jesus right but but the right hand would be would be the typically the more the stronger hand than just the assumption of day that most people even still today are right-handed um that that is typically the hand of strength and so the right hand would refer to the use of your power not just actions which is the hand but then right hand 
underscores the power. Uh, does that help, Sue? I'm going to assume yes, and I know you're having some audio technical issue. Uh, um, any, any, Carol, any questions or comments? Okay. Sue, please. Okay. I, I just, um, that is fine. And I, sometimes I, I'm not quite hearing what you're saying. So um, I'm doing my best here. Okay, I'm sorry. I know it's probably the internet and, and no worries. I will try to speak slowly as I can. All right, we're going to move on to uh, Psalm 139. And uh, John, if you are able to join us, uh, I'll give you an opportunity to unmute your mic and perhaps read uh, Psalm 139, taking the first six verses. Um, it's going to be for the choir director, again, by David, a psalm. And we're going to have a lot of the attributes of God described. And as you le read through this in the various sections, note we're not just talking in the abstract or philosophical. Every attribute that we have of God is going to have an application to our life, both a warning and then a comfort, warning those who disobey God, comfort to those who believe in him. And so we'll pause after each section of the attribute of God and, and let each of you maybe, if you want to think of one warning, one way that that attribute serves as a warning, one way it serves as a comfort. John, is your mic able to uh, be shared with us today? Well, I'm... You're cutting me out completely. I'm losing video and audio. Okay. Um, John, now and then, so I, it's okay now, but uh, I'll, I'll start. Yeah, John, why don't you, if I'll you begin, turn off your see, own. See, see if I can get through all six verses. I cannot hear you. I lost your audio. I lost your audio now. Okay, John, um, if you turn off your own camera, you can try that, but why don't you just go ahead and listen as much as you can. Um, but uh, Carol, it sounds like you're working the best of all. Let's let you read verses one through six. Okay. <clears throat> that is all knowing. All right, this is the King, New King James Version. Um, here, uh, verse one. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and, and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and be, before and You have placed your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot grasp it. So I thank you, John, for sharing that. Why don't you go ahead? And John, if, since you're having the issues, if you turn off your own camera, turn off your mic, uh, that'll help you be able to listen and, and follow. And we won't, we, we'll save your participating and sharing until a time when internet is, is working better. Um, as we go through this, the God is all-knowing. I appreciate that John uh, read that New King James, that, that he, he's, uh, he's searched me, uh, investigated, you know, maybe doesn't have, it sounds more, uh, more impersonal, but the Lord actually does investigate, but then he also searches. Um, and that's a warning for us, right? Uh, because he knows what's in here, even my sinfulness. Excuse me, I had to mute just a moment as I sneezed. Um, and, and then it's a comfort for us that the Lord then knows, when he investigates, he knows my biggest needs as well. Um, when, wherever I am, he's there. And so he has that omniscience. Um, and then also the truth that uh, there's a fence behind me. Uh, really, whether that we are a sinner trying to escape an angry judge or we are... Uh, staying safe in the yard of our Heavenly Father, that fence uh, can be a warning or a comfort, and all of that is in God's omniscience. Uh, does anybody whose mic is working uh, feel like uh, sharing a thought on, on God's omniscience? Uh, that is the word that means knowing all things, all knowing. 
Yeah, Carol, please. Yes, I have a thought. I have, I have so many friends that, you know, make idle comments about God's too busy to look at me and how can God know what I'm doing? <clears throat> and I think this is a, a good reminder for all of us that from eternity, God has known us and has loved us in spite of us. And that's just awesome to me. And as far as the, the fence behind me and in front of me, I think it's both. <clears throat> I think the fence protects me from <clears throat> doing bad things and <clears throat> reminding me that, that God is, is there. Uh, so it can be, it can be a, a fence to keep me safe and make me feel good. And it can make, make a fence that might irritate me, but it's for my own good. And right, is, Carol. Thank, thank you for that. You are exactly right. That fence is both. And, and it, it functions for both of us at, at, at all the time because we are, um, like we've said, uh, a sinner and saint at, at the same time. And, uh, and we, we do need both that fence to remind me I can't escape from God as an angry judge, but uh, I also have that fence to protect me um, staying in the yard of our Heavenly Father. And, and as a Christian, we always come back to that protection of the fence after we've been comforted with the gospel. So, anything else on that first section? Okay. Um, I saw in the chat uh, comment. Please, John, go ahead. It's in the chat. Uh, the chat. Okay. Um, uh, the I chat. wrote, uh, it's a warning that God knows our thoughts, words, and deeds. That, that's what I wrote. Okay. Yep. And very good. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't have the chat box open. Now I, now I do. So, John, if you want to share your thoughts at any time it works, now I've got that chat box open. And that's definitely how, how it is. So God does know all of our thoughts, words, and deeds. And that is a warning, a warning for us. So uh, we're going to go on. And Carol, if you don't mind reading verses 7 through 12 then. Okay. God is present everywhere. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there you are. I rise on the wings of dawn. I settle on the far side of the sea. Even there your hand guides me, and your right hand holds on to me. And if I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light will become night around me, then even the darkness will not be too dark for you. The night will be as light as the day. Darkness and light are all the same to you. Okay, so yes, definitely omnipresence, and God is everywhere. Omni, I didn't say that earlier, but omni is the Latin word for all. And so, uh, yeah, right, it says even, where can I go from your presence? The NIV footnote says that presence might be a term that actually uh, refers to God. And, and that word presence, uh, as it says, um, that can even refer specifically to the second person of the Holy Trinity, um, you know, the, the God who is present here with us. Um, surprisingly, verse 8, right? If I make my bed in hell, there you are. And so that question comes up to our minds. Is God even present in hell? That is the Hebrew word Sheol, probably in, in the New King James Version, still using that uh, with John. And, and so, yeah, yes, God is present everywhere. That means he is even present in hell. But my comment in here that people in hell do not experience God's gracious presence, um, but they do and must recognize that the Lord is even the master of hell. Uh, he, he is the master of all things. And he, it's not the devil who's even in control there. Um, that's why Jesus Christ descended into hell to show that he even has control there as the risen Lord. But yeah, even that, you know, I can't even get far enough away from God. And, and that's such a comfort for us Christians 
wherever I go, right? God is there with me. I mean, yeah, and that also means the judgment warning. I can't get away from him if he's as the angry, angry judge. Um, so verse seven, it's a little bit amb ambiguous as Carol started reading because um, it's ambiguous because we can't tell if David's planning to escape from God. He's talking about run aw running away and there God is. But then he gets to verse 10 and it clarifies, right? No, his description of escape is hypothetical. What, what's he doing? He's actually rejoicing in the presence of God because of how God's hand guides him and his right hand holds on to him. Uh, I actually watched uh, for an association with a class I just had, had to watch a movie about uh, someone who became sick with cancer and wound up passing away. And it wasn't a Christian movie, uh, but it talked about the poetry of John Donne um, and, and all of that and, and the presence of God, you know, so his holy sonnets and trying to deal with death. Um, and the movie tried to deal with that without bringing up Christ. And yet they had a little children's book, The Runaway Bunny, who said, I'm going to run away. And, and the mother bunny says, I'm going to come chase you down. The bunny says, I'm going to become a boat and sail down the stream. And the mother says, I'm going to become the river. And, and in that way, it's a wonderful picture when you think of it. This is God who, who doesn't even let us run away from him. Uh, he follows us and chases us again with his grace. Uh, questions or comments about God being present everywhere, his omnipresence? To Carol, please. When I read this, <clears throat> and especially because the hell is not capitalized here, I can, to, to me, it, it makes me think about the times when I have felt that God isn't there for me, that there's kind of like a Job thing when things are bad in my life. Even though we think that God has deserted us, he hasn't. And yeah, and I do understand that, you know, God is omnipresent and he does know about those that are in hell and Satan. But sometimes we make our own hell, so to speak, here on earth because we, we grieve the Holy Spirit and we, we just don't take advantage of all the blessings that God wants for us, but he doesn't let go, no matter where we go on this earth, he'll be there. Yeah, yeah, very, very true. We even we, as however bad it gets, uh, if life is a living hell, right? Well, I still have God's presence, and He is the one who turns things around, and His grace remains me, with me, even in in a, even in a rough and difficult situation. Um, all right, I'm going to take the next section, reading of 13 through 18. Uh, God is powerful and good. Verse 13, for you created my inner organs. You wove me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and my soul knows that very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unfinished body. In your book, all of them were written. Days were determined before any of them existed. Your thoughts to me are so precious, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I would count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. I await, and I am still with you. So as we read through that, uh, this here gets to the omni, omnipotent, uh, almighty, uh, all-powerful. And in this section, uh, his creation is, is presented making me, but then even though he uses the natural process of conception and birth, God's power is still evident because he preserves and maintains nature with, with personal care, right? Even just thinking that knit me together inside of my mother's womb, not, not just nature and biology uh, impersonally doing what it does. God. God was instrumental in making sure that nature worked that way. Uh, and this section doesn't specifically address abortion, but this truth uh, is relevant to, to abortion, right? That God, the giver of life, is the only one who has the right to take it. 
And so uh, we, we recognize that wonderful gift of God in, in human life and, and just praise him for it, even in the, the, the unborn. Uh, so any questions on, on uh, God, the giver of life, and that indicator of his almighty power? Yeah, Carol, please. This year would discount all the <clears throat> theories about creation that don't include God, because this talks about God being with people even before there was any creation. Yep, yeah, right. God making people even before there was, you know, before all any of the days were written, right? All of all of the uh, bodies, God, God knew all of it before it even happened. Before, before any of them existed. God had it all planned out. Yeah, very, very true. Um, and then verses 17 and 18 actually review the first three omni words. It goes back to uh, um, the omnipotent is here, but then the thoughts, God's knowledge, his omniscience, his presence. Uh, verse 18, uh, you're still with me, so his omnipresence is there. And, and 17 and 18 will remind us that my note there on, on this column says never separate out God's qualities. We might in doctrine class make a list of words that adjectives that describe God, but we really, it, it's, not, it's not worthwhile. It doesn't do us any benefit to consider any of his qualities by themselves, standing alone. But you take them all together. Our discussion of each attribute of God looks at the same loving care from just a little bit of a different angle. God doesn't change depending on which attribute we're talking about, right? He remains the same. So other thoughts or questions or comments uh, uh, on this section of verses? Okay. So then we wrap up. A Carol, I'm going to let you read the rest of this psalm. Uh, Psalm 139, if you take uh, verses 19 through 24. God is holy. If only you would slay the wicked, O God, so that bloody men would depart from me, men who speak against you maliciously. Your adversaries misuse your name. I do not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and detest those who rise up against you. I absolutely hate them. To me, they are enemies. Investigate, investigate me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my troubled thoughts. See if there is any way in me that causes pain and lead me in the way everlasting. So, so this section um, now does make it very personal again um, as, he, as he sticks with the word I. And he gets back to the original thought of, uh, of God knowing all things and ask God to investigate him. But before he gets there, um, the attribute that stands out here is God's holiness. And we don't use the omni, you know, omni holy, all holy, but he is completely and totally holy. But we don't say it that way because holiness um, is really perfection and we don't need to say completely holy because holiness is just a word by itself indicates absolutely without any sin. And, and since he is holy, um, it's, it's also something true that we have to keep his attribute of holiness in mind, even in, as we consider the attribute of love, right? Love does not destroy God's attribute of holiness too. Um, the one who is the loving forgiver of sins is at the same time the holy punisher of unforgiven sin. You know, we, so we look at the attributes of God, all of his characteristics, from a little different perspective, uh, and that's why we, we see this, but we have to recognize uh, it, forgiveness is not God wiping sin under the carpet and saying it's not a big deal. Forgiveness is saying, no, I am totally holy. For me to be with you, with a sinner, I must make you holy. And I'm going to do that in the only way possible by sending my son to be your savior. And God did it. It's the only reason that God, who is holy, is not angry with us. Because he's forgiven us in Christ. And you take all of that concept together 
Um, and and you, you see that as all the attributes of God brought together. Um, and so we see also describing the, this hate, again, harsh words, reminds us of the imprecatory psalms, right? The calling down curses. Uh, the psalmist, again, is saying, I'm going to agree with you, God. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And the answer assumed is, yes, I do. And don't I detest those who rise up against you? Yes, I do. Um, those who love God will hate and oppose God's enemies because then they are also my enemy as well. Uh, any, any question on that? Uh, Carol, please. Yeah, thank you for reading 21 again. I knew something was off when I read it, and I just had turned the words around. So do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and detest those who rise up against you? So I appreciate the clarification there. And it, it, it does, you know. It, it... Yep, uh, as, it, as it hits home, yes, go ahead, Carol. With, when we're confronted day after day with evil, we, we truly do wish it would end, and God will end it in his own time. And he, he will find us a, a way to, to manage in the meantime. Yes, very true. And when we are confronted with that evil, uh, did you catch what the evil uh, around David, he thinks about his enemies at the end of verse 22, leads him to verse 23 and uh, investigate me, God. And it's that concept of, oh, there as God's enemy, but for the grace of God, I would be there too. So really, David is not saying, investigate me, God, because I'm so holy and perfect and good. No, he is with humility circling back and asking God, God, use your knowledge. And so you're going to see each and every sin of David. So combine that knowledge with your love and your power and your mercy in Christ Jesus and cleanse David of everything. And so as God investigates and cleanses, that is where David finds this way here in verse 24 uh, to be led by God in the way of life everlasting. Um, and so, yeah, God cleanses David of every evil, and that's David's prayer here, a humble prayer, not filled with pride to say how, how good I am as you look at my heart. Carol, go ahead. Yes, just exactly that, is that the only way we live the way we do in our faith is because that faith is a gift of God. It is it's just so awesome to recognize that. And it's a, it doesn't really fit in our mind because we want to think we're good. But there is no, truly no good in us. The only good that exists is put there by God. Exactly. Yes, very good. And um, I didn't mention it. I, I kind of scroll back up again, thinking of uh, uh, the end of verse 18, right? Uh, that um, God, God is so wise and he is omnipresent. But the end of verse 18 takes us back to the result of God's forgiveness. David says, I awake and I'm still with you, right? Or that God is still with David when he wakes up. And I can think of that. This can be a good morning prayer uh, every day to take Psalm 139, verse 18. I wake up, God, and I'm still with you. But then let's take that to the next plane, recognizing that is even true when we go to sleep in death, and we wake up, right? We wake up in that blink of an eye, right? After, as we die, we are still with God after death. And that is waking from that, that slumber that God grants. And so again, we, we see that God's power, his mercy, his holiness, his forgiveness, um, all of those attributes of God presented for us. Questions on, on Psalm 139 at all? Because you had a few folks with their internet issues, I'm going to make a command decision here, and we're going to save 140 until we have a few more people able to join us in, uh, in the study. Um, and actually, Psalm 140 could allow for quite a bit of discussion that might take us past our, uh, our normal time. So, We'll end with, uh, with a word of prayer, maybe a little early, earlier than, than normal, but um, we will uh, just say here, I'm going to take uh, Psalm 138 here 
and read verses 1 and um, verse 8 as a closing prayer today. Dear Lord, I will thank you with all my heart. Before the gods, I will make music to you. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Lord, your mercy endures forever. Do not let go of the works of your hands. Amen. Amen. Thank yeah, thank you everybody who made it through to join us.